Okay. Okay, shalom everyone, welcome. Ruchim habaim, tzohoraim tovim, or for Professor Bendor, we could say Erev Tov, he's on Israel time. Uh, good to be together on this beautiful afternoon. We are gathered for the Harry and Blanche Posen Memorial Lecture, and you've come for a real treat. Professor Bendor will be reflecting on this first year of the post Netanyahu era in Israel. We are recording this session. It's my obligation to make that known to you. And um, of course, Gabi has been joining us at Holy Blossom Temple for many years now. He's a real friend of Holy Blossom. His annual lectures are a highlight each spring in the season of Yom Hazikaron and Yom Hatzma'ut. And last year we were online with him and it worked so well. Uh, here we are again, but Gabi, we do look forward to the day when we can welcome you back to Holy Blossom Temple in person and you can be with uh, your many good friends here in Toronto. Before we turn to learning about current Israel, our homeland, we wish to acknowledge the good land of Canada where we are fortunate enough to make our home. Holy Blossom Temple rests on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Ojibwa Chippewa, the Huron Wendat peoples. Through a series of treaties, some made in good faith, some made under duress, Toronto is now covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples call us to rise to the challenge of truth and reconciliation and to respond to the 94 calls to action. And Gabi, you might be interested to know that this is becoming a, a widespread practice uh, across Canada to acknowledge the land and, to, and the many peoples who make a home here. Uh, this week, I've been hearing from so many congregants and friends that they are now traveling to Israel for work, for family reunions, for tourism and pleasure. Uh, my own son is on the birthright trip now in Israel. And so it seems that um, the gates are now wide open again. Thank God it is healthy to travel often and uh, with confidence. So that is another way that we can reinforce uh, the very strong bridge between Canadian Jewry and the state of Israel. And it's against the, uh, the backdrop of our calendar with Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzma'ut just last week that we will um, hear from Professor Bendor in the context of these emotionally charged days on the Jewish calendar. I'd like to announce um, how the Q&A will work. There will be time for questions and answers. And the way you can participate is if you see at the I think for most people, there's a bar at the bottom of your screen. And one of the icons there, a little to the right, is called Q&A. And that's where at any time you can drop a question um, in the chat box there. And we'll be able to draw from those questions after the, the lecture. I'm pleased to share a mazel tov with you. This is um, news hot off the press that Rabbi Zachary and Katie Goodman have just brought a new baby into the world. Uh, just last night, he would have been with us today um, to run the Q&A and to welcome Professor Bendur. But it's my pleasure to, um, to join you now and Les Rothschild, who is Rabbi Goodman's partner in our Israel Engagement Committee, will be drawing from the questions that you drop um, in the comments section. So thank you in advance, Les Rothschild, for your leadership. And finally, we wish to thank the Posen, Spiegel, and Cohen families for their longtime devotion to Holy Blossom Temple and to the gift of this annual learning with Professor Ben Doer. It is a true gift that the Holy Blossom community and our many guests are able to enjoy learning with him. So now I would like to welcome to the screen Stephen Posen, representing the family. Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> My name is Steve Posen. And on behalf of the uh, Posen Spiegel Cohen 
clans of families, we'd like to welcome you at the annual lecture uh, that uh, we have been sponsoring uh, for in memory of our parents, Harry and Blanche Posen. Harry and Blanche both believed in lifelong learning and we could think at the time of no better way to honor them than by having an annual lecture in their honor and in their memories. For many years, thankfully, we have been blessed to uh, have uh, Gabby Van Dor deliver that lecture. And uh, it's always been scheduled as it happens at about this time of the year, which happens to be close to our mother's birthday, May 8th, close to our father's yard site on May 20. We thank you for assisting us in remembering our parents who we still, after all these years, love and miss dearly. A brief word about Gabby Bendor. Uh, Gabby Bendor uh, is well known to all of you. Just a couple of little comments <clears throat> to introduce you yet again. He's a professor of political science uh, and director of the National Security Studies Program at the School of Political Sciences at Haifa University. He has published seven books and over 120 articles in scholarly journals. Professor Bendor, it's hard for me to call him Professor Bendor, even though he deserves it. He's my friend. Uh, Professor Bendor has been a frequent visiting lecturer at a number of universities in Western Europe, Africa, Singapore, Canada, and the United States. I actually first met Gabby when he was here on sabbatical many, many years ago. I uh, often tell a story that he regaled us with at that time about the guess about who are the largest security agencies in the world. And all three of them, all three of the, the top security agencies were all Americans. And that's relevant because of what's going on now in Ukraine, most probably. In addition to all of that, Gabby has just been, it's just been announced rather, <clears throat> pardon me, that our, uh, was announced on Israel Independence Day, that the Israeli Political Science Association will be awarding Gabby its prize for excellence in research and academic leadership. Uh, and so it's long since deserved and congratulations, Gabby. I'd like to reinforce what, uh, what Rabbi Splansky said, the, 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 the proceedings will be recorded and available uh, subsequent to the event. And if you have questions, submit them through Q&A that will keep that session lively. And I want you to join me please in welcoming our friend, my good friend, Gabby Bendor. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Rabbi, for this very, very generous introduction probably much better than I deserve. And uh, I think that this annual meeting, this annual en encounter, I should say, that I have with the family, with the congregation, with the Jewish community in the city are really highlights of my annual cycle. And I'm really, really eagerly looking forward to having another go at it next year, God willing, with the pandemic, not over, but under control. As the rabbi said, people have started traveling and feeling safe. And hopefully next May, we'll be doing all this in person. Uh, before I start the lecture, uh, let me share with you the most resounding innovation in the history of Zoom lectures, uh, which you will be uh, exposed to tonight. Uh, it turns out that many, many of my good friends who listen to my lectures really remember the stories and the jokes more than anything else. Surprise, surprise. So I have now written out the entire lecture in a PowerPoint format, which will be available to you if you, show, if you so wish. And I've included the jokes and the stories. This has never been done before. So I think that if we don't have enough time to go into all the issues and to tell you all the stories, you can read them at your leisure later on. With that in mind, let me start and say the following. I think that, okay, let me put the screen on. Oops. Okay, I would like to speak about friendship, uh, something that Steve has already mentioned. I have been fortunate uh, to have this friendship as a highlight of my life, really, for many years now, with the entire Posen, Spiegel, Cohen clan, as he calls it, or tribe, as I prefer. And it's really something unique. I have many friends, but I don't have many friends who are as good as these people are. And in particular, the two who are in constant touch with me 
who are Steve and David. And it turns out that though we haven't really seen each other for over two years due to reasons that are well known to you, we exchange greetings, we exchange cards, we say Shabbat Shalom, we say happy birthdays, we exchange views, and it's possible to become a long distance friends and to have the fundamental sentiment of friendship alive and well. So I would like to acknowledge that, and not only in terms of inviting me to give lectures and such, but in terms of having a human relationship rich, I think in deep experience, which I've enjoyed for many, many years now. So I would like to quote uh, this famous saying about friendship, that the greatest gift of life is friendship, and I've received it, and I thank God for it. A Jewish view of friendship, he who finds a faithful friend finds a treasure, which I have. And uh, a famous quote from uh, Emerson, it is one of the blessings of old friends that you can afford to be stupid with them, which is to say, if I say something entirely silly, I hope my friends will forgive me. How hard is it to give a lecture like this? Sometimes I've been asked. And so here's a story you will read later on. I will tell you the long and short of it. This is a story about Albert Einstein, one of the greatest influences on my life, uh, having spent many years at Princeton University, where, of course, his memory is alive and well at all times. And the story is that Einstein uh, gave a long series of lectures about relativity all over the United States in various university campuses until he got tired of the whole business. And one day he told his driver, Luke Harry, that was his name, uh, you have listened to my lecture so many times, you can give the lectures myself yourself. And I will be the driver. You will be the professor. I will be the driver. And so they drove to Dartmouth, uh, one of the great Ivy League universities that we are familiar with. And the driver gave the lecture. And no problems, word by word, equation by equation, number by number, formula by formula. And everything was fine. But when he started leaving, one of the research assistants at Dartmouth came up and asked him a very difficult question, which he couldn't quite answer. So he said, look, the answer to your question is so simple that even my driver is able to give it to you. And so he turned it over to Einstein. So whatever you cannot learn from me, you can learn from my driver. Let me start by looking at the new governing coalition and see what it has done. First of all, we have a new coalition which brings more streams in Israeli political life and social life together. And that's a great innovation compared to the Netanyahu era. There is less animosity within the government, more cooperation and more spirit of, uh, uh, of, of camaraderie and, and, and uh, less competition and less fear of the whole thing leading to personal animosities. But animosity in Israeli society between different political camps and sharp cleavages have not disappeared, rather they persist between coalition and opposition as badly as before. And we are at a stalemate once again about 48, 49% of the people in Israel more or less support or tolerate a Netanyahu government, 51, 52% don't, and that doesn't change. So the new government is something based on the common animosity towards Netanyahu, the anything but Netanyahu business, and it promised stability. But as a lack of certainty, the government lost its majority in the Knesset, it only has 60 seats, so it, it is unable, for example, to pass the budget in November. And without a budget being passed by the Knesset, no government in Israel is legal. On the other hand, the opposition doesn't have 61 seats to vote no confidence in the government either. So we are back to the old stalemate. Only different people are in government and different people are in opposition. I must also say that the most difficult issue for a political scientist, and Steve has kindly referred to my uh, uh, standing within the political science community in Israel. The most difficult issue uh, for a political scientist is to deal with personalities. And personalities are very important, obviously. Certainly Putin and Russia are a good case in point, and I'm coming to that a little later. And Netanyahu still overshadows everything else. Whenever the Israeli Prime Minister Bennett is attacked on any issue, his first answer is, but Netanyahu did the same, or Netanyahu did worse, I am doing better than Netanyahu. Everything is compared to Netanyahu. Everything is sized up against the magnitude of Netanyahu. Everybody stands in the shadow of Netanyahu, even though I don't think he's coming back. And I'm coming back to this point myself a little, little later. But Netanyahu has led 
to a national obsession in Israel, the like of which we have never seen. The result is a lack of ideological coherence. We have a government which has absolutely no common denominator other than the animosity towards and the fear of Netanyahu and the fear of his return. We have left and right, we have Jews and Arabs, we have all kinds of people, and which is good in a sense. It's good to bring them together and to show that you're one people and we can live together and govern together. But the government lacks ideological coherence, which is to say it doesn't have any real guidelines based on a perspective or a worldview. As a result, it escapes from difficult decisions, postpones everything into the unforeseeable future, and nothing much gets done by way of major changes with a couple of exceptions I'm coming to. Perhaps the greatest innovation is the Arab party in the governing coalition, which is always on the brink of quitting, but right now it is still in the government. This is something great, and I will perhaps talk about this a little later. I think it's a real revolution in Israeli political life, and it's also a revolution in the Islamic Middle East. Having an Islamic religious party, which says we are able to work within the democratic framework of a state dominated by another people. That is a revolution of sorts, and I think it's worth referring to. But the continued debate about the Jewish character of the state is the other side of the same coin. What is Jewish about the state, and what is the role of Jews and Jewishness in the state? And these questions are being debated. There is no consensus on this within the government because of the huge distance between the right wing of the government and the left wing of the government. So the governing coalition in that sense is unnatural, as is the opposition. The government is united by the hatred of Netanyahu and the loathing of that person. And of course, the opposition is uh, totally coalesced around Netanyahu. That makes the entire decision-making process very, very difficult. That's by way of introduction. Now, I would like to share with you the gospel according to Jackie Mason, one of my favorite comedians, who says, money is not the most important thing in the world. Love is. Fortunately, I love money. So what do I have in mind? In Israel, as in every other country, two major things make a difference. One is the economic situation, and second is the general mood of the people. Are people happy or unhappy? Are they optimistic about the future? Are they pessimistic about the future? So these are the two things I would like to start with. So on the domestic scene, the first thing to point out is a very strong performance of the economy. Now listen to the data. The GDP per capita, which is the best measure of economic well-being, is almost 55,000 American dollars, which puts Israel as number 20 in the world. Only two places behind Canada, which is at 57,400. But ahead, listen, ahead of the United Kingdom, ahead of France, and ahead of Germany, which means that the average Israeli in Tel Aviv, Haifa, and Jerusalem makes more money than the average citizen in London, Paris, or Berlin. This is something new. And the question is, credit is due where? Is it something that the present government has done in one year? Or is it something which is by way of a process going on for many years? At the same time, inequality in Israel, while slightly down compared to last year, is very high. Actually, the second highest in the OECD. The OECD is the Organization of Developed Countries. And only two countries are worse off. One of them is the United States, which is the ultimate capitalist example. Second is Mexico, probably the most corrupt state in the OECD. This is bad. Israel suffers from a great deal of inequality. People in the booming high-tech industries are making a lot of money. People who are doing many menial jobs are not doing so well. And the gaps between rich and poor are very high. And the middle class is not big enough. But the most important thing to my mind is not the objective data, but the subjective ones, which tell about the feelings of the people. What do they think of themselves? What do they think of the country, of society, their place within these two? And most importantly, about the future. Are they optimistic that the country will do well and their children will have a nice place to live in? Or are they not? Because when people are unhappy about this, they leave the country's concern. And that's why you see huge waves of migration uh, from these countries. Now, here are the data, and I would like you to take a good look at this. This is the so-called World Happiness Index, updated literally two weeks ago. 
which measures the happiness of the citizens and also uh, data such as length of life, life expectancy and such. And look at the numbers, we can learn a great deal from this. One thing we can learn from this is that the really happy people in the world are all Scandinavians. Look at the data. Number one is Finland, as it was last year. Number two is Denmark, as it was last year. Number three is Iceland, which came up one place, all three of them Scandinavian countries. Number four is one of the richest countries in Europe, Switzerland, which has lost one place. Then we have another rich Northern European country, Netherlands, a tax haven, Luxembourg, small country. Next two, surprise, surprise, are Scandinavian countries, Sweden and Norway. And then comes Israel, which has moved up three places from last year. Now listen to this. It is ahead of New Zealand or Australia, ahead of Germany, surprise, ahead of Canada, ahead of the United States, ahead of the United Kingdom, ahead of the best doing Eastern European country, which is the Czech Republic, numbers 19 and 20, which you cannot see, are Belgium and France. I think that means a great deal. Israelis suffer a great deal from anxiety about the security situation. They work harder and more hours than people in other parts of the developed world and so on and so forth, but they are happier. Why are they happier? Because they stick to traditional values like family, like community, like society. They see a purpose in their lives. They feel they belong. They feel that they fulfill a historical ambition. And that makes them happy and tolerant towards all the difficulties we are dealing with. So I think that's a very, very important measure. So in fact, Israel is doing well, both objectively economically and also very well in terms of subjective feelings of the people. What has the government done in terms of politics and diplomacy? Look at the regional scene. First, we have continued improvement in the relations with the so-called moderate Arab countries, which means the, the traditional Sunni monarchies, uh, but no breakthrough yet with the most important of these, the Saudis, and also hedging by the Gulf kingdoms, which also carry the favor of Iran. Why is this? The most important word in this is hedging. Hedging means trying to belong to two different camps, which are a, at the opposing poles of a major conflict. And the entire series of improvements with the Arab countries has been made possible to a large extent by the strength and initiative of the United States with the retreat of the United States from the Middle East and the weakness the United States has shown towards the Iranians, the Arab countries have slowed down the process and we haven't been able to revive them with greater momentum as yet and probably won't be able to for quite some time due to the role of the United States in the region, as I said, which is on the decline. We have complex relations with Jordan, a lot of security cooperation on the practical level, and a lot of Israeli economic aid to Jordan, a very poor country which is doing badly economically. Jordan at the same time has taken uh, quite hostile attitudes towards Israel on many, many issues. Probably uh, the king trying to please his own public opinion, which is anti-Israeli, which is not good. The relations with Egypt have improved more. Uh, more public meetings with the Egyptian president and the Egyptian ruling elite. But again, on the people to people level and daily economic inter intercourse, we are not doing great. But the greatest, I think, development of the last year is the rapprochement with Turkey. Turkey is probably the most powerful country in the Middle East. It is the only Middle Eastern member of NATO with the fourth largest army in, in the Western world. Uh, also, of course, a country with a long history of influence all around the Middle East, with a charismatic leader who plays a major role in whatever happens in the region. And Turkey has played the anti-Israeli card very vividly and very dynamically and very successfully for quite some time. And now this is changing. The Turks have rediscovered the importance of Israel in world affairs. The Turks have recovered that Israel is a major energy supplier in the Mediterranean and they need the Israeli uh, deposits of natural gas. They need Israeli influence in Washington and they would like to be like Israel, to be on good terms with the Ukrainians and with the Russians and everybody else. And so they have decided to make a bold fuss and come back to a more moderate stance. And so the rapprochement with Turkey is important. And I would uh, point to this as a major achievement of the present government. The rivalry on the other hand with Iran has only intensified. There are no solutions in sight. 
uh, there's a continued stalemate on the nuclear issue. There's a constant daily uh, covert warfare between the two countries. Israel is attacking Iranian arms, Israeli bases, and Israeli uh, proxies in Syria almost on a daily basis. And Iran is building up uh, a major capability, not only on the nuclear issue, but in terms of drones, in terms of air power, in terms of sea power. There have been a lot of issues on the marine front. Most importantly, there is a continued stalemate on the nuclear issue, and on that the government has not done any better than the Netanyahu government, because the United States is still determined to rush to a new agreement, which is apparently a poor agreement by any standard. The Western European countries likewise, and the strong stance taken by all these countries towards Putin and Russia has absolutely no resemblance to what they are doing towards Iran. On the global scene, there was initial improvement with the new US administration. Certainly both Biden and Bennett are very different persons than, than Trump and Netanyahu. Uh, they are working together more quietly. They are working together with more uh, of an understanding about the needs of the other. There is no uh, example of vociferous public disagreement or anything like this. And I think that's important given the absolute importance of the US to Israel. There are also good relations with the UK and other major EU powers. Uh, the U UK government just published a while ago a memorandum of understanding with Israel, raising the level of cooperation with Israel. Likewise, relations are good with Germany, France, and the other leading European powers. There is the Polish question in Eastern Europe, on which the Israeli government, led by Mr. Lapid, the foreign minister, and the number two man in the government, and the future prime minister of this coalition survives. Uh, has attacked the Poles very vociferously on issues related to the Holocaust. Uh, there are many, many, many different views on this. And I think that uh, we will have to do something about uh, repairing relations with Poland, which is important for Israel. There is the Chinese triangle. China is investing massively in Israel. In my own hometown city, the city of Haifa, where I'm sitting right now at the moment, it has been building tunnels and bridges uh, and highways and a new port and everything else, which is important by way of infrastructure. Israel is doing very, very well in terms of relations with China, mutually beneficial set of very intensive relationships. And there comes the United States telling Israel, now, wait a minute, you are too close to our major rival. In the view of the Biden administration, the real rivalry is not the American Russian one. Russia is on the decline and is going to be a minor power in the foreseeable future, according to Biden. The real enemy, the real competitor, the real rival of the United States is China. And on that, the American administration is not very tolerant. And it is unhappy with Israel's proximity to China, including on strategic issues like building ports and taking part of communications and infrastructure. So Israel is stuck in a triangle. It would like to be on good terms with China, mutually beneficial. Of course, it depends more than anything else on the United States, and it would like to balance the two, and it's not very, very easy. As a matter of fact, if you follow the news on diplomacy on a daily basis, you'll see the American Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense commuting to Jerusalem, and the press will say that they talked about Iran, and they talked about Russia, and they talked about uh, the Middle East, and they talked about the Palestinians, of course. But I can tell you that the first thing they talked about was the China issue. Uh, some of you may not appreciate this, but the thing that bothers the Americans more than anything else in terms of the relationship with Israel is not Russia uh, or the Ukraine or Iran, but China. So the Israelis have started slowly uh, reducing the level of intensity in the relationship with China. For example, Israel has raised the uh, security demands for companies which are now uh, submitting tenders for building new ports, new airports, and the new areas of infrastructure. Uh, the Chinese are unhappy. We are unhappy because we don't want to do this, but we have no choice. Then there is the Indian, Indian connection. That's something that few people talk about. Well, ladies and gentlemen, India is about to surpass China uh, as the largest country in the world in terms of population. It is a major naval power already. It is one of the eight acknowledged nuclear powers in the world. It is becoming stronger. It is becoming larger in terms of its economy. It's becoming more sophisticated in terms of its technology. Israel and India have a very close relationship. So as a matter of fact, if you look at the situation, 
you'll see that Israel now finds itself in a set of relationships it could only dream of a couple of decades ago. It is on good terms with every major power in the world. It is in good terms with the US administration, still friends and allies. It is on good terms with Russia. I'm coming to that in a moment. It is on excellent terms with India. It is on good terms with China. It is on good terms with another coming superpower, which is Brazil, the most important country in, in South America. So on the global scene, in that sense, we are doing a lot better than ever before. Once again, uh, Netanyahu people will argue it is Netanyahu who built this up over the years. Other people will say it is the present administration in Israel, which in the last year has been active and has been playing the diplomatic card quietly and effectively due to the new foreign minister, Lapid, who is a very talented man indeed. Now, something about the Ukraine and Russia. In order to understand the role of Israel, particularly the efforts of Bennett to mediate, I really have to quote Einstein again, who said in a very famous quote, if my theory of relativity is proven successful, Germany will claim me as a German, and France will declare me a citizen of the world. But should my theory prove untrue, France will say that I'm a German, and Germany declare that I'm a Jew. And this is the story of Israel in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. It is a real problem for Israel, and I really would like to go into this in some detail because many people misunderstand the Israeli position. First of all, Israel is unique in the sense that it has very good relations with both Russia and Ukraine, just a fact of life. Israel has been doing business with them both. Israel has been talking to the leadership. Israel has the ears of both Putin and Zelensky. Uh, Israel has invested in both countries. Israel has received uh, numerous delegations with both countries. And Israel has a large population, uh, well over a million citizens out of the 9 million we have, who have come from either Russia or Ukraine, or both. I'm saying both because some areas are unclear. For example, I talked to my secretary today about a piece of business, and she asked me, what do I think of Putin's invasion to the Ukraine? And I said, well, I'm very unhappy about this. And she said, look, I'm from Kharkov, uh, the second largest city in Ukraine, bordering on the east on, on Russia. And she said, uh, I am a Ukrainian, but I speak Russia. Russian is my mother tongue, because in the Soviet Union, that was the official language. And also, I think that you should see that if the Russians have once again tried to advance their missiles to the proximity of the United States, like Cuba, uh, the United States might take very forceful steps, as Putin has. So she argued to my enormous surprise, a, a, a Russian-speaking Ukrainian Jewish lady, that having been brought up in the Ukraine and having, been, having seen the Russians trying to stampede Ukraine almost out of existence, she still thinks that we don't understand Putin, we don't appreciate his concerns and his very real fears and anxieties about the Western powers uh, coming uh, to the very proximity of Russia and putting long range missiles right on the boundaries of Russia, say in Poland or the Czech Republic, and trying to get all these countries to join NATO, which historically for the Russian point of view is a set of enemies who are trying to do bad things uh, which the Russian Republic must simply avoid. There is a mystery of Putin the man. Once again, I'm coming to the personality issue. Uh, just like we spoke about Netanyahu in Israel, or you can spoke about Erdogan uh, in Turkey. Putin is a mystery to everybody here in Israel. We know that Putin is a very powerful leader. We know that he uh, follows traditional Russian values. He's close to the Russian Orthodox Church. He's a Russian nationalist. He believes in Slavic uh, cooperation and possibly conglomeration. At the same time, he seems to be extremely friendly towards Jews and thinks Jewish and Israeli. Uh, he's on good terms with the major rabbis, religious leaders in Russia. He had a, a Jewish teacher for whom he bought an apartment right here in Israel. He has come to Israel a number of times and has, I, I listened myself, to one of his speeches here in Israel, in memory of the soldiers of the Red Army, which liberated the Jewish uh, population in Eastern Europe, including many of the death camps. And Putin said, look, we are a great power and we have our own agenda. And you guys are a great power in the Middle East and you have your agenda. 
and we cannot always agree and we never will. But I want to assure you of one thing, whatever differences might come up between us, we, Russia, will never do anything to threaten the vital security issues, let alone the existence of Israel. That's unheard of from a Russian leader, because Russian leaders have been traditionally anti-Semitic, some of them extremely so. So that is Putin. So we cannot ignore that. We are dealing with a leader who has always shown great understanding and sympathy towards Israel. Then there is the issue of the Russians in Syria. It is all very nice to say, you guys in Israel are playing a tactical card and abandoning morality in order to do that. But we will have to live with the Russians in Syria. The Russians will not see, live with Syria anytime in the foreseeable future, and the Americans will. So we will have to live with the Russians. And this is also the view of the Saudis, of the Egyptians, of the Emiratis, of the Kuwaitis, and all the other regional powers, none of whom have rushed to confront Putin on the issue of Ukraine because they are concerned with their own security. They are not seeing the United States exerting the type of leadership in the Middle East that they have exerted towards uh, uh, Russia in the Western Alliance, which has come alive during all this. So all of them are doing what I call hedging. They are trying to be on good terms with everybody, Iran and Israel at the same time, Ukraine and Russia, Russia and the United States, China and the United States at the same time. Israel has therefore tried to mediate, saying, okay, we are talking both to the Russians and Ukrainians, we have Russian and Ukrainian Jews in Israel. We are uh, interested in putting an end to this conflict. Since we can talk to everybody, why not mediate? And Mr. Bennett, the prime minister has tried that, has visited a number of times with Putin, he keeps talking to Putin on phone, keeps talking to Zelensky on the phone. Zelensky spoke to the Israeli Knesset, unsuccessfully, I should say, somewhat stupidly, and the mediation has failed. And I, here I would like to say something uh, which some of you might, not want to hear. Israel, with all the great things it has done, and I have counted quite a few of them, is a regional power, but globally it is not an important actor. And I think what Bethan tried to do was to punch above his weight. He has tried to play the role of a great power mediating between other great powers and such, and we are just not, we are just not there. We don't have the clout, we don't have the standing, we don't have the power, we don't have the tradition, we don't have the acknowledgement and the credit due to a country uh, which might want to talk to the Russians as equals, telling them now look here and look there and do this and don't do that. So I think, yes, Israel is salient and its leader, even if it's not Netanyahu, only Bennett, a, a fairly average politician, is still important because Israel is salient. Israel is seen on the world scene as an active uh, actor, it participates in many important activities, it can play a role, but it cannot take the lead in trying to bring this war to an end. It is beyond our power, it is beyond our size, beyond our magnitude, even beyond our interest. We should be concerned with things that are closer to us and which are more threatening to our vital daily interest. So one might argue that there has been a moral test here which Israel has most likely failed. I mean, if you say, who is right in this business? Certainly not Putin. So who is the aggressor? Certainly Putin. Who is committing seeming war crimes? Certainly Putin much more than the Ukrainians, if at all. So Israel should have probably stood up along with the other members of the Western Alliance more forcefully and condemned Russia. But like I said, Israel has many other concerns and Israel has to look after its own immediate interests because the most important imperative is survival. Russia is relevant to that and Ukraine is not. That's a very cruel fact of life, which has to be acknowledged. And so Israel will continue probably uh, to play this role of hedging now that it has failed to mediate. It is working very hard to do what it can do to help Ukraine by way of humanitarian issues, medical issues, uh, migration issues, uh, refugees and such. It cannot help Ukraine militarily. It cannot join the Western Alliance if the Western Alliance takes a much more forceful set of steps towards the Ukraine, which is based toward Russia, which is by no means certain anyway. And I think you should appreciate the depth of the dilemma Israel is facing. Uh, I myself am a little bit unhappy 
because I'm a great supporter myself of Israel as a Western liberal democracy, which should resemble other Western liberal democracies. But I can see the point of view of our leaders uh, and the reasons why they have taken the stand which they have. Now let me get to an issue which is of immediate concern to the people sitting here around the virtual table. And I would like to call here once again, the spade a spade. Uh, and let me make a comparison between Jews in Israel and Jews in North America. And uh, some of you might want to argue these points in, in the Q&A Q session. Fundamentally, Israeli Jews are politically conservative, whereas North American Jews are liberal. What do I mean by conservative? They are for tradition, they are nationalists, uh, they are strongly tied to religious, uh, uh, I would say traditions, their religious heritage. Uh, they are concerned with security. Uh, of course, they care about uh, human rights, they care about citizen rights, they speak about liberty, and we are a country of law and order and democratic decision-making. But about 55% of the Israeli public is right-wing in some sense of the term. By the way, including Arabs in Israel, the Mansoura Abbas party now in the government is a right-wing party. It is religious, it is traditional, and it is concerned less with the modern role of women than the rest of society. It is a traditional right-wing conservative group of people who find a common language with uh, other conservative uh, groups within the Jewish sector. So Israeli Jews by and large are conservative, I would say 55% according to recent research. North American Jews are 75, 80% liberal in some meaningful sense of the term, including voting for liberal parties. In the United States, that means the Democrats. No matter what a Republican president does for Israel, as Trump tried to do for some reasons, uh, North American Jews, American Jews in this case, US Jews will continue to vote for the Democratic Party, which is the real home, ideologically speaking. Secondly, this is a real point of contention. Israeli Jews believe that the conflict with the Palestinians has no solution, and they don't want any outside interference because they don't think it will do any good. But most North American Jews, according to research I've seen, do believe that there is a solution, and they also believe that they should work actively to promote it. That's a bone of contention between Israel and many, many North American Jews. Three, of course, as you all know, North American Jews are mostly reform or conservative, uh, uh, streams of Judaism, which Israel by and large does not recognize. And Israeli Jews are strangely enough, mostly Orthodox, by the way, both positively and negatively. By this, I mean that many of them hate the religious establishment and they stay away from the synagogue, but it is the Orthodox synagogue they are staying away from. When they say, I don't want to go to the synagogue, and I only want to go to the synagogue maybe once in my lifetime for the bar mitzvah of my son, they will want to go mostly to the Orthodox synagogue. It is deeply entrenched in Israeli national consciousness. And that's a very big bone of contention and it's becoming more and more so as time goes on. Because of course, for North American Jews, the communities they belong to are very important and rightly so. And they are reform and conservative congregations by and large, and these have not made any real inroads into Israeli society. They do exist, but they are not very big. Uh, I can see this in my own hometown, which comes from the more liberal stream of Israeli society. You see a couple of such uh, congregations, and that's all, uh, versus many, many dozens of Orthodox congregations, synagogues, and places of worship. The progress in all these issues is very, very slow. And I think that this has to be recognized. Now take a look at what I've said. There are three very major issues. One, the fundamental political outlook, which is different between Israeli Jews and American Jews, North American Jews. Secondly, the single most important moral issue which comes up is politics is the Palestinians and the rights and the possible solution. And on this, there is, I think, a very, very major uh, cleavage, very uh, sharp disagreement between Israel and the mainstream of North American Jewry. And of course, three, what is Judaism and who belongs to Judaism and who has rights and who has duties and what is Judaism going to look like in the future? On this, there is also fundamental disagreement. 
So if we want a real dialogue between Israeli Jews and North American Jews, we have to recognize that these are the three cleavages, uh, uh, bones of contentions, and we have to come to terms with them. We really have to talk openly about them and to make sure we understand the other side and to see to what extent we can find some middleware, some compromise or some coexistence because the issues are very, very emotional. Terrorism and current security. That's a bad issue. And here I would say that the government uh, which is presently in power should not be given high grades at all. Although one must uh, recognize that things were not an awful lot better during Netanyahu either. For one thing, the Palestinian issue has not been resolved and it's no closer to resolution than ever before. The idea of the Abraham Accords replacing progress with the Palestinians is a naive one. The Abraham Accords regulate relations between Israel and the established Arab countries, mostly in the Gulf, who follow their own interests and not those of the Palestinians. So what has happened is not that the Palestinian issue has been resolved, it has not. What has happened that the Palestinian issue has been relegated to the second tier of problems and it has lost its centrality and salience, certainly domination over the daily agenda of the Arab countries. But it doesn't mean that it has been resolved. It doesn't mean people have forgotten it among the Palestinians. It doesn't mean that the security problems stemming from having a lack of solution have been pushed aside. And actually, one might recognize that the Palestinian issue may be less important to Arab nationalism. Arab nationalists, Egyptian nationalists, or Syrian nationalists, whoever, don't really feel anymore that the Palestinian issue is very central to them as Arabs, but it, they have become more important to Islamic universalism. And they are playing that card just brilliantly. And when the leaders in the Gaza Strip now go to address public opinion all around the Middle East, they don't talk about their own particular problems. They are saying, we are not here to fight for the problems of Gaza, we can handle that. We are not even here to, find the to fight for the problems of the West Bank. We are here to defend Jerusalem from the infidels, from being de desecrated, from being violated, from being taken away from the eternal rightful possession of the Muslims to the dirty Jews. They have been very, very successful in that. And what you can see in the recent four or five weeks in Israel has been a resurgent wave of individual terrorism, no longer a matter of organized Palestinian groups, parties, or movements, but individuals inspired by their bitterness on the Jerusalem issue and on Islamic issues. And of course, these are now uh, in a synergy with Palestinian nationalism of the sort. And you see just normal people, standard people, people you would expect to mind their own business, all of a sudden taking a knife or an ax or a rifle and murdering Jews all over the country. And we have had this in cities inside Israel. We have had it in the West Bank. We have had it in Jerusalem itself. And it's still not over. And we have had a very, very tense situation during the last month, which, is, was, which was the holy month of Ramadan, uh, most important part of the year for Muslims. And we still have a couple of very important dates coming up, Jerusalem Day, and we have May 14, 15, which is Nakba Day, which is the day of uh, the uh, uh, Arab setback, allowed, allowing Israel to come into being. And we have, uh, I think, many, many problems we will have to face in the coming few weeks. In addition to Islamic universalism and Palestinian nationalist incitement, which I've already alluded to, we also have to recognize another problem. And this is the problem of massive amounts of arms, of weapons in Arab hands inside Israel, not West Bank or Gaza, but in Israel proper among the Arab population within the nine and a half million citizens of Israel. There are massive amounts of firearms, of grenades, of rocket launchers and all kinds of bad things in Arab hands being used for them, uh, for their own purposes on a daily basis, for uh, vengeance, for blood feuds, for crime, for extortion, for trying to take 
possession of the lands of others within the Arab villages. And Israel has tolerated this for many years, including huge rates of crime in the Arab sector in Israeli society. Many Israeli Jews said, well, let them take care of their own problems. Who cares if the Arabs murder each other? But that means that one day, these many rifles, these many pistols, these many hand grenades, these many rockets will be used for nationalistic and Islamic purposes. And this is happening already. So Israel has to make a major decision. Are we going to try and disarm the population in the Arab sector? Or are we going to tolerate the fact that we have a potential uh, small but very vicious army coming into being, which sooner or later will be fueled by nationalistic and ideologically extremist uh, Islamic considerations. And this is tied in general to what might be, we might call the weak, weak level or the low level of governability in large parts of the country. In large parts of the country, uh, particularly in the South, in the Negev, you have illegal construction, you have crime and extortion to an extent which is unimaginable, which looks like Chicago in the 1920s. People paying protection money to keep their businesses open, people fearing to ride their cars in some uh, major highways down south. And this I call a problem of governability. Israel has in fact said it's our territory, but we don't want our government to really rule them. We let the local population to do whatever it wants. And there are problems with land, and there are problems with roads, and there is problem with infrastructure. And indeed, Israel has not done enough to improve the lives of the people there. But at the same time, these people, to an extent, don't even belong to the country. Let me give you one example. Uh, Israel has been very liberal, Israeli law has been very liberal in allowing uh, unification of families. An Israeli Bedouin Arab would go to the West Bank there to marry a, a wife or two or three or four, and then import them back into Israel, eventually establishing a family which is Arabic speaking, uh, where the mother still has her own family in the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. And these people grow up within Israel, but they're not Israelis in any sense of the term. They don't speak the language. They don't feel a sense of belonging. They don't follow the rules. They don't think that their future is really with the country as it is. And some of these people are driven to extremism of the type that we have seen in recent weeks. Having said that, I think the problems are indeed those of governability and fighting crime and perhaps implementing a more understanding and a more sympathetic policy towards the needs of the Arabic speaking citizens of Israel. But despite all that, and despite the terrible events that took place last May, and of course the resulting trends of extremism on both sides, mostly on the Arab side, research that I and others have done shows that more Jews and Arabs now believe in coexistence than last year, which is to say they are pessimistic in the short run. They think that there are major problems to confront. And we are not doing well in confronting them, but they do believe that in the long run, uh, it is possible to exist, that the democratic character of Israel can co-opt, tolerate, and manage the kind of conflict which uh, ethnic groups have. And like I said, we have living examples of this in the person of Mansour Abbas, uh, a man who believes in Islam, uh, a faithful Muslim, who consults uh, uh, the sages of, of the Muslim community before making political decisions, just like the ultra orthodox Jews go to their own rabbis, uh, to their own council of rabbis. But he wants to do whatever he feels should be done within the rules of the game of Israeli democracy. He wants to win elections. He wants to be in the governing coalition. He wants to use his power of veto in the governing coalition to get more resources, more understanding, more money, uh, more of everything that the Arab community in Israel needs. But he wants to do it without violence within the rules of the democratic game. And most Israelis agree that this is the way to go. Conclusions. First of all, let me say that it is possible to govern Israel reasonably well without Netanyahu. The government has done, as I said, pretty well on the economy, has done pretty well on the global scene, has done well diplomatically all around. 
Uh, all, all this not only without Netanyahu, but with the vociferous opposition of Netanyahu in the Knesset and outside. That's an important fact of life. Just like at one point, Israelis could not imagine Israel without Ben-Gurion, and Israel could be governed without Ben-Gurion, it can be governed reasonably well without Netanyahu. Second, uh, how do you say it in the French parts of Canada? Uh, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The record of the new government on most issues is similar to that of the previous one. It hasn't done too well on Iran, just like the previous government. It hasn't been able to eradicate terrorism, just like the previous government. It has never uh, been able to resolve the major disagreements with the United States over Iran, just like the previous government, and so on and so forth. Seemingly, there are two differences. One, that there is a, a regular and orderly budget being passed, which governs the economic life of the country, which is true. And the second is the pandemic. On the pandemic, there were major differences. This is something we now tend to forget. The Netanyahu government tried to really uh, uh, weed out uh, uh, COVID altogether, uh, including very forceful steps, isolation and, and curfew and all that. And the present government has said, we have to live with COVID, whatever the cost. And it has done that with a degree of success, although one can argue here too. First, uh, what is the price we have paid in terms of people who, who died because of this policy? And second, to what extent is this policy reasonably successful because of the foundations laid down by the Netanyahu government, uh, which led the world at one point in, in the effort to uh, try and vaccinate the entire population. Uh, having said all this now, Netanyahu is still all over. His spirit is hovering all over the country. And on every issue that comes up, are you for Netanyahu or against Netanyahu? Did Netanyahu do this or did Netanyahu do something else? And yet, his return is increasingly unlikely. His legal problems have not been resolved. Uh, he's on trial, uh, will be for years to come. And I think that many people uh, in the right-wing opposition can now recognize that on his final departure would allow the political spectrum to return to a sense of normalcy. What do I mean by this? At the present time, uh, and Netanyahu enjoys the confidence of 56, 57 members of the Knesset. And there are two right-wing parties to his right in the government. The government, uh, the party of Mr. Bennett, the prime minister, and the party of Mr. Saar, the minister of justice. In between them, these control another 13 seats. Now, if these 13 seats, right-wing, joined the right-wing of Netanyahu, we would have a stable right-wing government. But this is not going to happen because the these people and these parties will not join a government led by Netanyahu. And that perverts the entire normalcy of the country. It doesn't make sense. So we need to uh, restore some degree of ideological coherence by the parties and the leaders involved. And this is not going to happen uh, until Netanyahu is around. So I think it is possible that sometime in the next year or two, we are going to see a movement quietly gaining strength within the Likud, within the right-wing opposition, saying well, Netanyahu has done very, very great things for the country. He's a giant uh, compared to everybody else, but he has done whatever he could. He cannot do it anymore. He cannot put together a governing coalition. And perhaps for the best of the right-wing itself, uh, he should go. And I think that unless and until that happens, the country will continue to have a perverted and abnormal sense of order. Finally, a couple of comments on what Israel should be like morally. Ben-Gurion used to speak about Israel as a light unto the nations. And he kept saying that whatever Israel is doing in terms of army, agriculture, education, and the ties between Israel and the Jews and the diaspora would all make possible the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that the people in Israel will be a covenantal people and a light unto the nations. In other words, an exceptional people. But his great ideological rival, Jabotinsky, said the exact opposite. Listen to this. We are a people as all other peoples. We do not have any intentions to be better than the rest. We do not have to account to anybody. We are not to sit for anybody's examination. And nobody is old enough to call on us to answer. 
We came before them and we live after them. We are what we are. We are good for ourselves. We will not change, nor do we want to. So where should we, Israel, stand? Should we really try tikkun olam and be a light unto the nations? Or should we say we are like everybody else, looking after our own interest and business, and we will continue to do so no matter what other things in terms of moral judgment. This is very relevant to Israeli attitude towards the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And that's it. So I would like to end uh, with a story exactly on time, 8.30 as promised, because I would like to leave time for Q&A. The most important thing that I've tried to do today, as always, thanks to the friendship and support of, of the Posen Spiegel Cohen clan, has been to spread knowledge, to uh, allow you to get insights that perhaps you have not thought about, to look at some data, to increase and enhance your knowledge and understanding of Israel. Because whatever disagreements we may have, the worst enemy we have is simply ignorance, not knowing what is happening, not knowing what the others feel, not knowing what the data show and such. And ignorance is really the greatest enemy historically of Jews. So I would like to end the story on, on, with a story on ignorance. We started with Einstein, uh, the greatest enemy of ignorance, and we will end uh, with Einstein. And the story is that Einstein died and went to heaven, and St. Peter had to admit him to heaven. And he said, look, all kinds of people try to sneak in. How can you prove to me you're Einstein? So Einstein said, give me a chalkboard. Put down a few formulas. And St. Peter said, of course, you can enter heaven, you're Einstein. Then came Picasso, and he said, I would like to enter heaven. So then St. Peter said, how can you prove you are really Picasso, who your identity? Picasso said, give me a chalkboard. He drew a few lines, uh, a few figures. And St. Peter said, of course, you can enter heaven, you are Picasso. There comes Donald Trump, and St. Peter asks him, uh, Mr. Trump, all kinds of people claim to be what they are not. How can you prove your identity as Einstein and Picasso did? To which Donald Trump answers, who are Picasso and Einstein? And then Peter says, you are admitted to heaven. You are indeed Trump. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, and maybe I, uh, thank you, Professor, for, for covering off um, a wide range, as you always do, of giving us a sense of what, uh, you know, what is, what is happening in, um, in, in Israel and what the feelings are. There are, a couple of, there are a couple of questions, so I'll bring those up, and I would encourage all of you, if you have some questions, we've got lots of time, so please, um, Put your questions into the chat, and I see they're they're now coming back in. So I'll have to take a look at them as they come in. But let me go through going back right to the beginning. And your the the happiness um, score that you talked about is always very popular, um, and uh, is always it's you know it's uh, pleasing for us to see that as well. But the question is, do you think the happiness score within Israel is stronger in religious or secular communities, or is it similar across both? I think that the differences between the religious and secular communities are exaggerated, except in one sense, which is politics. The religious tend to be much more right-wing than the secular. But on other issues, the similarity is striking. For example, demography. It turns out that secular Israeli liberal Jews have a similar number of children to religious Jews, which is astounding. I mean, the normal Jewish family, secular or religious, has over 3, 3.1, 3.2 children in Israel which is the highest in the Western world, way ahead of everybody else. On the happiness index, uh, there are great similarities between the religious and the secular. Whatever fulfillment the religious find in, uh, in the religious gospels they believe in, the secular people believe in the ideology of Zionism, the ideology of cooperation, the ideology of the importance of labor, uh, satisfaction from work and such. So yes, I think Israeli society in that sense is, is, is very, very, unified. Let me add also that surprisingly too, in the Arab sector in Israel too, there's also a high level of happiness. So these Arabs will uh, vociferously attack Israeli policies and enthusiastically support Palestinian issues, rights and progress towards nationhood and all that. 
but they would, none of them would move from Israel to a Palestinian state. They are Israelis. They belong to Israel. They enjoy Israeli freedom and democracy and prosperity uh, and reasonably good governmental services. And these are important facts of life uh, all over Israel. So there are some differences between the different sectors, but the general score of the happiness index is shared by one and all. Great. Les, as the questions come in, if I can just ask one quick question. Sure. Um, and if I, if I may. Gabby, you always make us or make me always feel very good and optimistic about the way things are. However, on this occasion, given the rise of the random acts of violence and your, uh, your comments about the uh, uh, intermittent governability in various different sectors of the country, but including in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem where there have been acts of violence, I'm not so sure I don't, I feel as optimistic as I always do after I hear you speak. And I would like to give you an opportunity to respond either to affirm or deny and explain. First of all, you are right that one of my major objectives in giving these lectures is to make you feel optimistic. And uh, I think on the whole, I've been successful over the years. I think that one can be optimistic only if one is realistic. I mean, to be optimistic by ignoring the problems won't do in the long run because your illusions will be shattered by the cruel facts of life in reality. So I think we have major problems, governability, crime, terrorism, and Israelis nonetheless are happy because they think that the problems are manageable and tolerable. I think that at the moment, the problems of governability will force Israel to come down hard on these problems. And I think that's good. I think we can deal with them. The problems of terrorism come up and down all the time. We had them in the year 2000, much worse than now. We had, had them last May, uh, in a sense worse than now, because they were within the major large Israeli cities, including my own hometown. And what we now have are more isolated uh, incidents from private individuals driven to extremity by religious obsession, as well as the other factions I have mentioned. And we in Israel believe we can handle these things in, in a variety of ways. Let me tell you one other thing. Most problems will not go away. There will always be some terrorism given the factors that I've already alluded to. The animosity between some extreme fringes of the Islamic Arab community and the state of Israel will not go away anytime in the foreseeable future. I think we can contain them within our democratic structure. And we see progress. I think that the isolated acts of, in, of, of violence, random or otherwise, are really discouraging. But I think what Mr. Mansour Abbas represents, the ability of Islamic elements, very traditional ones, to integrate into Israeli society via the democratic structure and process of politics is more encouraging and more important in the long run. So it's not that we are ignoring the problems. We know the problems, we are aware of them, we are conscious of them, uh, we recognize them. And I think the more we do this, the better off we will be in terms of coming to terms with them. Of course, we need a stronger government with a larger majority in the Knesset to take the unpopular decisions uh, which are necessity, necessitated, I think, by the exigencies of the situation. So I'm giving you a, a, a seeming contradiction, an oxymoron. On the one hand, very, very serious problems, some of them uh, proliferating. On the other hand, a rising sense of optimism. What does that mean? That means that the Israelis feel that the abilities of our society and our political system exceed those of the problems. Or that the greater the challenges, the greater our uh, skills and abilities to respond to them. And I think it's a very good realistic attitude. And I share them with my fellow Israelis. Okay, okay. okay. let me sort of go back to some of the questions. Some of the questions um, related to the current, really current political situation and what's happening, what's happening in the Knesset now and what you're, what you're feeling is will happen in the, in the short term. And there is one question as well that says, if, if it goes to an election, what do you think will happen? So just generally, uh, your, your comments about I, I, even today, I think they, there's you know, some, some movement. So give us yes. some, some idea. Let, let, let me start by answering the second question flatly out. Namely, if there are elections, what will happen? Nothing will happen. We are going to have the very same results. We are going to have a block of parties supporting Netanyahu who will gather 56, 57 seats and everybody else will be against them and they will put together another coalition. 
which means that a new election, given the present situation, will make no sense because it will not change the fundamentals which take away the ability to govern. What we would need, I think, is a new situation without Netanyahu. If that were to come, new elections would make a difference, perhaps. Second, what is the present situation? I've said the present government came into power with 61 seats out of 120 in the Knesset. One major leader of that coalition has now defected, so it's now 60-60. But the 60-60 is very strange because the 60 against the government are not united behind Netanyahu. For example, the joint list of the Arab parties, which controls seven seat, eight seats, uh, is very much against Netanyahu. So on occasion, they support the government and will not support a constructive no confidence motion, which would bring Netanyahu back. They are interested though in elections because they would like to fight it out with Mansour Abbas and his, his party in the governing coalition. They would like to fight it out in the Arab street and say that what Mansour Abbas is doing, cooperating with the Jewish Israeli system is not acceptable to the Arabs. So in that sense, they are uh, deliberating the possibility of leading the country into new elections. In terms of mathematics, it's an absolute stalemate. As I said, 60 for the government and 60 in any constellation against. Now, in order to bring down, down the government, you need 61 and the opposition doesn't have it. In order to govern effectively and to pass a, pass a budget, the government needs 61 seats and the government doesn't have it. So that leaves us in a stalemate, which is likely to be resolved one way or another in the next few months by November, because November 15 is the deadline for passing the budget. The other question would be, uh, perhaps asked by a guy like Steve, then given this mess in Israel, how can anybody be optimistic? Well, the answer is from research I have done is very simple. The Israelis are optimistic because of their society, not because of the government. Sometimes they're optimistic despite the government. They believe that the fundamentals of Israeli society, the strengths of Israeli economy, technology, social solidarity, uh, level of knowledge, uh, willingness to serve the country are sufficient to offset the problems of the political stalemate. And on issues which might come up to test this, for example, in another war in Gaza or something like that, which unfortunately is not impossible, I think that the various parties would put away the differences and unite behind the government. What happened today less was that the Arab party leaders went to their own council of sages, the Islamic uh, uh, imams and so on, to consult them what to do. And uh, to my pleasant surprise, the imams decided to stay in the government saying that Abbas's way to try and get the resources necessary for the development of the Arab community in Israel should be tried within the rules of the game inside the government, which was a good decision, I think, uh, to make and very encouraging. So at the moment, the stalemate continues. But you don't see me or other Israelis terribly worried, but worried about this because we think that the country takes care of itself. The economy develops, people work, people are happy, people go to universities, they study, they do research, and they don't look at the government at all times. I think that this exaggerated confidence that the government will know what to do, it will make the right decision, is characteristic of some of the Western democracies which have lost their own uh, sense of confidence in the abilities of the society and the citizens and the community to look after themselves perhaps better than the government can. Great, thank you. Got a, a, a question from, uh, I know you, you know uh, David DeWitt, and I'm just going to uh, uh, read it as, as he wrote it. Gavi, terrific presentation as always, thank you. What are Israeli attitudes to expansion of settlements, legal as well as illegal? and whether government policy and lack of actions exacerbates Israel-West Bank relations. He, here there is a perception that this is not only a serious political issue, but that it is un undermining both Israeli in institutions, the Supreme Court and Israel police and PA legitimacy. Okay, um, David DeWitt of course is a very, very good friend of mine and not just a good friend, but a co-author with me of, of books and articles, conferences we have run together. So thanks for the question, David. Uh, and uh, I think that the answer to this question is very complicated. Uh, most Israelis believe that the areas of the so-called West Bank are part of the historical homeland and therefore Jews should not be excluded from there. As to the, uh, that's the general moral question. 
As for the practical political question, is this a good time to expand the settlements? That's another question. Most Israelis would say no. There is no point in that. I mean, it would not serve no particular purpose, and it would uh, undermine our relations with the United States and many, many streams of liberal public opinion in the West, as well, of course, as in the Arab world. Bennett himself comes from a right-wing party, which was very much in favor of expanding the settlement. So he has his own opposition within the right-wing of the government. So he tries to balance his act, as always, between these two. He would like to be on the right side of the moderate Arab countries, and even more so the United States, which means not to expand the settlements. But at the same time, remember that a single member of the right-wing a sector in the coalition can bring down the entire government. And therefore he tries to play up to these uh, factors within the government. And so the government has come up as always with a compromise that they will expand the settlements by 4,000 units instead of the 6,000 units planned. This was sold to the Americans as a great compromise. Uh, the Israeli public doesn't particularly care about this. Uh, and the right wing parties got something that they wanted. This is also part of our democratic process. My own view, of course, is that at this point, expanding the settlement serves absolutely no useful purpose and should be postponed, if at all, to the indefinite future. Great, thank you. Thank you. When a, there's, there's a, a question, uh, sort of a series of, of questions, uh, one person asked about the Ukraine, and obviously that's on, on our minds now. And the, the series of questions really are, are, are they're all, it all is tied together, but it's a, a lot of it what we're thinking. So it's, do you think Putin's closest confidence are telling him what is really happening on the ground in the Ukraine? How do you think the situation will end? Is it possible that Putin will be pushed out? And how much longer will the aggression continue? All of this we're recording, so we're, we're going to see if you can answer it correctly. <laughs> Uh, let, let me try and answer it by quoting uh, the Chinese uh, President Xi, who is the second most important leader of the world, uh, more important than Putin. When he is asked such a question, what should be done about the Ukraine, he would say, no, he would, he has said two things. One, NATO expansion to the east towards Russia serves no useful purpose. Second, the integrity of all countries, including Ukraine, should be upheld and not violated. So the Russians are right in being angry with the West for NATO expansion, and they are right in demanding that Ukraine not be part of NATO. The Russians are wrong in having invaded Ukraine. I think these are the good guidelines for the future. I think what should be done, and I think what will be done eventually is some kind of compromise, which will indeed keep Ukraine out of NATO, uh, which will not lead the Russians to see Ukraine as an imminent threat to Russian security, at the same time, Ukraine will continue to live as an independent country, possibly losing uh, some of the um, Russian-speaking uh, uh, provinces in the East, which have declared their independence, uh, something along these lines. As for Putin, uh, is he being told the truth by his, his, his advisors? Obviously not. I think that Putin is told by his intelligence uh, facts, which are uh, fake facts and assessments, which are fake assessments, and I think he knows it by now. What his intelligence people told him in the beginning about the possibility of invading the Ukraine quickly, coming to Kiev, installing a pro-Russian government, and getting the Ukrainian people accept them as liberators, as an absolutely crazy fantasy, uh, out of touch with reality completely. I think uh, Putin is now recognizing that his intelligence uh, people told him things which were absolute fantasy. And I think he distrusts the people around him. You can see that he is unhappy, that he's dejected, uh, he's somewhat pessimistic, but at the same time, he has no good way uh, to exit at the present time. And that's why I think that efforts at mediation coming along these Chinese lines should be welcome. Israel has tried something like this. As I said, this was too big for us. The Turks are now trying this uh, without much success, but I think that eventually Russians will come to their senses the price that they are paying for their aggression is enormous, economically, politically, diplomatically. They have done more than anything else or anyone else in the past two decades to unite the Western allies, to revive NATO, to get neutral countries like Sweden and Finland to join the Western alliance via NATO. And these are terrible things from the Russian point of view. So I think Putin will come to his senses uh, sooner or later, hopefully sooner. And once again, if you want to quote me in five years or whenever, say, was Bendor wrong or right? 
I think that the uh, eventual compromise would be on the lines I've outlined. Ukraine staying independent but out of NATO, Russia quitting everything other than maybe the couple of Eastern provinces, and then uh, Russians will have to do some homework, rehabilitating their military, reviving their technology, everything Russian broke down in this war. Terrible. Okay. Can I, can I ask one question less? Um, sure, sure, uh, of course. Gabby this, uh, Gabby, this may be a pretty big question, but if <clears throat> there's an Arab party or an Islamic party in the Israeli government, <clears throat> if the Israelis don't see any solution to the Palestinian problem, um, what are your thoughts about Israel eventually becoming a single binational state? I think it would not be a good thing. Uh, obviously, what we want is a Jewish state. And I think that's one good reason for not uh, annexing territory and not uh, expanding settlements and doing all these things, which would get Israel more involved in the West Bank than it already is. I think uh, the right thing for us to do is to reduce our commitments and involvements and presence whenever we could and deal with the problems within our own country, within Israel proper. And we have tried to do that in a number of ways, including the um, unilateral withdrawals under Sharon, uh, disengagements and the like, which haven't really worked. But I think they are being uh, once again considered as possibilities given that there seems to be nothing else. There seems to be no single Palestinian leadership you can reach an agreement with. The Gaza leadership is obviously uh, too extremist too committed to violence and, and terrorism and fanaticism. The West Bank leadership is corrupt, old, and out of touch with reality, entirely unpopular, and really having even much, much less governability than Israel. So an agreement is not in sight. And therefore, what we should do is to live without an agreement, preventing and avoiding the scenario, preempting the scenario you are depicting here of a binational state. We don't want a binational state. We want a national Jewish state. And the only way to do this is to recognize that some places which we now control uh, should be given up or given away because us being there serves no good purpose if you believe in a Jewish state. Uh, so uh, I've, I've been involved in some harsh disagreements over that within Israel, but I stick to my view that this is for the good of all of us to try and to do as much within Israel as possible and as little outside Israel as also possible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one, one last question that is that just is uh, uh, just in, in today's news, so maybe you, you can comment on that. And that is, can you comment on the Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera journalist who was killed in Janine today? I don't know if everybody knows about that, but there was a journalist killed in, um, in Janine. We don't know whether that she was killed by Israeli or Palestinians fire, but we know Israel will be blamed. Can you... It, it, on what happened? I, I it, it is already, Israel is already being blamed uh, as always. I don't know either the facts any more than you do less. So I really don't know. I know that we are looking into this. I think that there is a very good chance that she was killed by the Palestinians themselves. Also, one wonders why she was there. I mean, why was she involved in a firefight between Israelis and Palestinians on the Palestinian side? Uh, in any case, we don't want to kill journalists, we don't want to kill anybody, least of all uh, people who are innocent bystanders, as she was to some extent. And uh, of course, we are sorry for all this. And we will be blamed for this, uh, no matter what, because whenever you kill a journalist, uh, of course, uh, every person who believes in the freedom of the press and such uh, will come and blame you. One should add that she worked for Al Jazeera, as you mentioned, less uh, Al Jazeera, which incites against Israel, which incites for extremism and in favor of terrorism. So it's not uh, the New York Times correspondent or even uh, the Toronto Globe and Mail correspondent who was there. It was somebody who was heavily involved ideologically, possibly, in what was happening. And one might ask, why does Israel, even given its democratic character, allow a hostile station inciting for violence and terrorism against the country to be present in the country? and to broadcast on, on my television system right here in my living room. Al Jazeera broadcasts freely in both English and, and Arabic. Uh, fine, okay. But the presence of its correspondence on the ground, possibly being involved in the incitement and altercations 
always on the Palestinian side, uh, is reason to worry. Maybe we should look into this right after this problem is resolved somehow. We should look into the future to make sure that such people uh, do not enter the terrain and uh, taking risks uh, for themselves and for the rest of us. So I'm very unhappy about this. And I, I also share your fear that we will be blamed for this. I do know that uh, Israel has offered to the Palestinians to set up a joint commission of inquiry to look into this. And the Palestinians have refused. It's a very good card for them. And they will milk the cow to the very, bend, to the very best of their abilities. Uh, we in Israel in general are not doing well uh, in dealing with the press uh, and in uh, trying to fight for public opinion. And this is yet another case in point. Even if we prove that the Palestinians themselves killed her, I don't think we will be blam blameless. And I think that uh, uh, we will try in the future to avoid such situations altogether. Great. And on that note, I think we'll, we'll uh, sort of wrap it up for the questions. I want to thank everybody who's put the questions in. And I'd like to turn it over now to uh, David Rosen, to uh, close, David Rosen, sorry, to close it up. Uh, thank you very much, Les. Um, Gabby, um, every year we invite you to come and speak. And every year there seem to be new crises, new things to talk about, new analyses to, uh, to go through. And you do it in such a consummate, amazing way in a, in a pretty constricted amount of time. Um, covering off, I think, pretty much everything, you know, um, political, economic, uh, you know, international, uh, intra-Israel uh, realities. Uh, interesting to see the GDP is up, happiness is up, um, notwithstanding all the other issues. But, but the way you have, have broken this up into various chapters, so to speak, and I'm so grateful uh, that this has been recorded. But the point is that there's a lot to chew on here. And the fact that you've been able to put the case um, so well and, you know, good news and, and not such good news um, in a way that, as you say, it's important to be realistic and to educate ourselves on what's going on. Um, and you do it superbly well, as you have again today. And for that, we are extremely grateful. Um, the other thing is that uh, there's philosophical elements here that you bring into it, your own humor, your own humanity. Um, it's a pretty complete package, and uh, that's why we've been so grateful to have you join us all these many years um, uh, past. Um, in order to both educate ourselves and to honor our parents, uh, Harry and Blanche Posen, which uh, this lectureship was intended to do, and we thank you for um, honoring us in that respect of being able to honor our parents. Um, but you began by saying, talking about the gift of our friendship. It definitely goes both ways. And, and um, your friendship to us, I mean, you know, you are a teacher, you are a mentor. Uh, the fact that you have allowed us to become your friend uh, and have been such a, a warm and welcoming friend means a, a, a tremendous amount to us. And for that, I also want to thank you. So on behalf of all of the people who joined us this afternoon, and certainly the members of our Posen Spiegel Cohen clan, which by the way is now 67 years, we are now a family. Uh, we are now in our fourth generation with um, Steve's uh, grandson. Um, the point is that um, this has been a very special uh, hour and a half that we've been able to spend with you. And for that, and I will say, um, not, well, shalom, but also we will keep in touch and uh, thank you ever so much. Great, thank, thank you, David. And thank you everyone for, for coming. Once again, I, I, on behalf of Holy Blossom, I wanna thank the uh, uh, Posen, Spiegel and Cohen families for continuing to do this. Um, I think, you know, with the, that, the friendship that you've talked about is, is uh, really, really evident. Um, one, one, uh, just a couple of things that I'd like to mention, we're continuing with our is Israeli programming for the next couple of days uh, in, in celebration of Yom Mood. On Sunday at 11.30, uh, we're having a, fam a, you know, a, a family block party. Please you know, come, come by, it's gonna be outside with music and entertainment and everything you wanna do to celebrate Israel. On, um, 
And then there are two programs coming, more coming up on Monday. One is the, uh, uh, the CEO of the Israel Reform Movement, which is a little larger than I think you believe, Gabby. So maybe you, if you, you might want to come in and hear her. But um, Anna Kozlanski will be, will be with us at, at, at noon. And then our Rabbi Tepper will be talking about uh, the um, uh, uh, play that is called A Flag is Born. Uh, and uh, you, you burn, Ben Hecht's uh, play that he wrote about the, the establishment of Israel. So those are th two more things, three more, couple more things that are coming up. Lots of other things on, at holyblossom.org. Hope everybody has a great afternoon, and we look forward to having you in person next year, Gabby. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.